We've developed this culture where the victim has almost become sacred. So there's a sort of supply and demand issue with trauma that everybody in a way wants to be traumatized. And you guys have talked a lot about activists and people who are kind of, you know, they're hypervigilant a lot of the time. They're looking for something that's hurt them. They're looking in a paranoid kind of way to go, oh, you must be a racist, you must be a sexist. And that's, it's not the only thing that's going on, but one of the things that's going on is that people have been hurt, they've been abused, and they um, have come to see the world as a threatening place and they're looking for threat everywhere. So, you know, victimhood is the opposite of agency, it's the opposite of healing. And I think one of the big problems in our society is that we don't have a way to be good. And we need that. And it's almost a very old fashioned idea to talk about ethics and virtue and morality. But we need that as people, we need a way to be good. And in the absence of that, people will adopt whatever they're offered, which may be a good consumer or a good social justice person. It's like, all you have to do to be good is this, is say this thing on social media, mm. Mm. all right? So it offers people a cheap and easy way to be good. That like we, we pretend that strength is a, is a vice and weakness is a virtue and it's not. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is an embodiment teacher and trauma educator who's worked in conflict zones like Syria, Afghanistan, and more recently Ukraine. Mark Walsh, welcome to Trigonometry. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and I didn't mention the intro, you've had your own experiences with cancellations and you know people not liking what you say and stuff. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Many of that. Before we do though, tell everybody who are you, how are you, where you are, what has been your journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? Sure, well, first of all, I'm very happy right now because you've just given me steak. So um, that's the first for me on an interview. So. It's what we do, man. I've uh, been well actually, fed, been well fed. Well, it's good. We, actually, somebody wrote a hit piece about us, or mostly about me. And one of the main criticisms was when he came in here, we were having steak. Uh, uh, so you are now problematic as well, mate. I am. My vegan friends in Brighton are going to be upset. Um, They're so always upset. They're always <laughs> upset. That's what they do best. Um, grew up in East Anglia. I was just saying to American friends, I call it the Alabama of England. I was um, from the Fens. Uh, come from a family of teachers and crazy people, basically. And um, my story in some ways is parallel to that of Western civilization in that I was really bright cognitively but was a complete screw up. And by the time I was 17, I was very alcoholic, drug addicted, suicidal, just a mess. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic, so I kind of grew up in that a kind of trauma soup and um, thought, you know what, I go to university, study psychology, figure out what's going on here. Um, but by that point, I kind of thought, you know what, maybe the answer isn't in a book. And I went to a martial arts school I uh, was involved in some sort of low-level crime and things, and I thought it would be a good idea to learn martial arts. And I went in there, and I, I saw into a dojo for the first week at university, and it just spoke to me. And there was discipline and beauty, and I, just something in me went, you need that. And I, I just devoted myself to martial arts, barely went into the library at university. And, um, you know, I did the psychology degree. But, um, yeah, for me, I pursued the martial arts. I was a live-in martial arts student. And then that sort of opened up into uh, dance, yoga, meditation, improv, uh, theater, the whole field that I would now call the embodiment field, which is all the things that work with the body is a bit more than a brain taxi. And realized there was a whole sort of another education out there, which would be very obvious to say a Japanese person. You know, they would do martial arts in school and develop the character through that. Uh, but it wasn't obvious to me. And um, eventually started teaching that. I teach a lot of coaches now. I uh, was, was working in nonprofit sector for quite a while. So I was um, working in various areas of conflict. And uh, yeah, most recently in Ukraine, it's a bit of an emotional day today, actually, because it's uh, today's anniversary of the invasion, as you know. So um, a lot of messages coming in before this that were quite, um, quite emotional. So I've um, got that kind of churned up a little bit today. Mm, and um, we'll talk about that, of course. Uh, you And uh, when I introduce you as embodiment teacher, I imagine most people go, huh? 
what the hell is that? What the hell is that? Yeah, yeah, my, my family still do that. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like- Are, they, are like, they still telling you to get a real job? No, I did, a, <laughs> I did a job with the House of Lords on trauma about 10 years back. And then my dad went, oh my God, this must be a real job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but until that point, um, yeah, they definitely, even for Christmas and stuff, they're like, what is it you do again? Um, so it's a way of looking at a human being. So I train a lot of coaches, I work with business people, different ways to describe it, but it's, it's a form of intelligence, essentially. Um, so you can be cognitively smart, but you could also be smart with people. You can be emotionally intelligent, you know, you can be charismatic, you can be, I don't know, good under pressure. All those things are part of embodied intelligence. And it's also just a kind of um, umbrella term uh, for all the kind of mindfulness-based body arts. So not so much exercise, not so much physicality, um, more the body as who we are. The body as relates to who we are as people. I'm very interested in that from a lens of trauma and culture and leadership and different different um, things within that. That sounds really, really interesting. So trauma, we talk about it a lot, but I don't think that people actually understand what is meant by the term trauma. What is trauma and how can it impact people's lives? Yeah, I mean, it's become a kind of fashionable term, right? Like everybody's traumatized yeah, by everybody yeah. else in a way, which I find a bit silly, particularly when I look at some of my messages today. <laughs> um, so overwhelming events. So overwhelming events um, create us get stuck in that fight or flight or freeze response. So most people understand the idea of fight or flight. We all have that bit of stress in our lives going on. Um, but if that's chronic, if you're chronically there, that impacts your perception, cognition, critically your relationships um, or in the freeze response where people are more shut down. You'll see this more in Eastern Europe. Um, close down them. You know, they're not smiling, they're not being so empathic perhaps. And that makes relationships very difficult. It means that people are very unhealthy physically quite often. It can show up in loads and loads of ways across different domains. Um, but yeah, being stuck in that fight or flight or freeze response is one very simple definition usually coming from experiences of um, overwhelm and powerlessness. And um, yeah, it's a fascinating topic. It's a trendy topic. It's been hijacked by the left. We can talk about that. And, um, you know, for me, it's just a very practical thing as well with some of the work I do. It's interesting that you mentioned, sorry, Francis, no, 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 uh, no, no. that there's a political dimension to it. I find that a bit odd, actually. It is. It's very strange. So um, where to begin with this? Um <sighs> I'm trying to, try to find the way in that's best to sort of think about this. So most psychologists are on the left, okay? There's kind of, you know, Jordan Peterson maybe and a couple of others who are more conservative or more centrist even. So they have a particular way of looking at the world. That way of looking at the world um, could be uh, that it's society or culture that causes problems, yeah? And it's not the individual's fault or responsibility. And there's definite truth to that. So, for example, there's a psychologist called Gabon Mate, who's very well known, I think does great work. And he says, hey, it's not your fault, it's society, it's culture. And that is an important perspective. Uh, but I would say it's probably not the only one. The other thing is our culture's become somewhat psychologized in that it's become a weapon. So if I say you've upset me, that's one level. But if I say you've traumatized me, or, you know, you're an abuser or something like that. That's a much higher accusation. And we've developed this culture where the victim has almost become sacred. So there's a sort of supply and demand issue with trauma that everybody in a way wants to be traumatized because then it's like, okay, then I get certain accommodation. Um, and I think it is a way of looking at the world. If some, somebody has trauma, they feel unsafe, right? The world has become a dangerous place. So what do you do about that? And one response is to try and control the world, try and control people's speech, thinking, etc. cetera. Um, I think a sort of integrated approach that takes both a left and a right wing perspective is a healthier perspective um, for looking at trauma more sort of holistically. Uh, the other thing is sometimes it just seems a little bit like first world problems these days, uh, particularly compared to Ukraine or somewhere like that. Mark, but... The issue is, as well, that we talk about trauma. I was listening to an interview with Dr. Steve Peters, who wrote The Chimp Paradox and a yeah. former guest on Trigonometry. And he actually says that 
there are some traumas that can never be overcome because the hard wiring of the brain, particularly if it happens, I think it's below the age of nine or 10, it's just hardwired there and there's not a lot you can do about it. You can learn to cope with it, you can learn to find ways to deal with it, but you're never in a sense gonna be able to overcome it. Do you agree with that? I'd say there's a lot you can do. And this is, you know, for example, if I'm educating people about trauma, one of the things I'll say is, hey, here's how you might spot it. And I've heard soldiers, for example, in Ukraine go, wow, I didn't realize that's why I'm drinking or that's why I'm finding it hard to be with my wife or that's why I'm getting irritated with my kids. So just education is brilliant, first of all, just learning about it. Um, there are definitely things you can do to make it better. I mean, I'm a case study of that. You know, I grew up in a pretty rough household and I have a good marriage. I have a good job. I'm relatively healthy physically. Um, there are effective treatments out there. There are things that work, you know. So for example, one of the things I do is I signpost people. I say, hey, you might want to check out this therapy. And they say, oh, I don't like talking about my feelings. It's like, no problem. You might want to check out this one. Well, you don't have to talk. So there are a bunch of stuff out there that um, works. And one of the main messages I have when I meet people with trauma is like, There's, there is hope. Yeah. And I've, I've definitely seen that. You know, my mentor works with abused children, for example, some of the worst cases you can imagine. I've worked in multiple war zones and there is hope. And um, there's a lot we can do. Um, there's cultural stuff around that, like some whole cultures are traumatized. Like I've worked a lot in Israel, in Russia and Ukraine, and there are whole cultures where trauma has become almost normal. And um, that's pretty interesting to me too. So what are the symptoms of someone who's traumatized? How, do they, how does it manifest physically? Yep. How does it manifest emotionally? Okay, so two main sets of symptoms. We've got uh, hyperarousal symptoms and numbing symptoms. So you can think of it as too much or too little, the nervous system being shut down or wired or some combination thereof. Hyperarousal symptoms, uh, sleeplessness. So for example, one of the reasons I used to drink is because I couldn't sleep. Now I can sleep fine without any kind of sedative, right? But that I was hyper aroused, that's anxiety, sleeplessness, I'd wake up absolutely buzzing. Uh, you'll see this in Israel, people are just wired. You know, I went on a holiday there and my wife's like, because she's Ukrainian, so she can go on holiday there fairly easily without a visa. And she went, it's a beautiful place, Tel Aviv, and the food's nice and your friends are lovely. <laughs> We've got lots of good friends there, but she said, it's not very relaxing. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's wired, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, so, and I can feel that, I can walk in a room and go, okay, this trauma here, these people are, have got that nervous system state where they're in that fight or flight. And that can manifest in loads of ways, like how people think, you know, their politics, they want, they're scared, so they want a politician to be more authoritarian, right? Mm. Um, or they're paranoid, like there's, you know, there's, there's scarcity, there's a sense of not enough, and you've got to fight for yours. Um, there's a certain way of looking at the world, and it also may affect like the digestion, it may affect the, um, uh, immune system, it may affect sexual systems. So like there's loads of ways that being wired could manifest. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of things is the shutdown. So that's, you know, the, the Russian smile, you know? That's the uh, emotional numbing where sometimes numb people hurt people because they don't have that normal emotional response to another suffering. That's where it's dangerous. Um, they might just feel cut off from life you know, I remember just coming back from some places and just being very blank, you know, slight thousand yard stare or the sort of lack of emotion rather than hyper emotion. Uh, and then people self-medicate in different ways, right? So let's say someone is hyper, they might use alcohol or, you know, opiates to come down. If someone's not feeling, they might be, I don't know, have a crazy sex life or do bungee jumping or something just to feel alive. Mm -hmm. There's ways people try and medicate those issues. I say a key thing that comes out of it is the damage it does to relationship. It is hard to be in a trusting, intimate relationship with trauma. Um, that's why so many like British servicemen, for example, uh, get divorced. That's why you know, so many firemen and policemen have problems, nurses have problems in their marriages um, or with their kids. So uh, yeah, how it affects intimacy. The, the fight or flight system is kind of antagonistic to our kind of connect sort of more mammalian connection system. So, um, and there's neurological reasons for this that others are better educated than me in. It's really, really interesting in the way that you've broken it down and the way you've displayed, because I used to work in a school, everybody drink, but one of the signs that we knew if a child had suffered sexual abuse is because they were hypersexual at an age right. before, they, before puberty, for example, or if they were going through puberty, they were hypersexual. 
and before people would look at a child behaving like that yeah. and shame them for it. But now, because we have better knowledge, we look at that child and go, okay, there's something going on here. This needs investigating. Yeah, I saw that in the slums of Brazil when I worked there and it was pretty disturbing to see, but it's a warning sign. Or even little things like, I used to work a lot with kids in England. And if you tap a kid on the shoulder, a normal kid will um, go, oh, yeah. They won't do nothing. They won't just sit there, like learn helplessness. And they won't go, you know, they won't get paranoid or attack you or anything like yeah. that. They'll just go, oh, someone's tapped me on the shoulder. And you see that right through to adults and how they respond to things. You know, do they respond with apathy and not doing anything or like a hypervigilance? So, you know, you guys talked a lot. Love your podcast, by the way. <laughs> I'm a fan. And you guys have talked a lot about activists and people who are kind of, you know, they're hypervigilant a lot of the time. They're looking for something that's hurt them. They're looking in a paranoid kind of way to go, oh, you must be a racist. You must be a sexist. And that's, it's not the only thing that's going on. But one of the things that's going on is that people have been hurt, they've been abused, and they um, have come to see the world as a threatening place and they're looking for threat everywhere. I think also... Um, and you tell me what you think about this, but my impression is as well is there is a certain validation. But if you are not in a healthy place yourself yeah. and you don't want to deal with that and you don't want to admit that and you don't want to consciously be aware of that, it's very comforting to say, well, the world is messed up. All right, I'm fine. I'm uh, fine. The uh, world's uh, messed uh, up and that's why I'm going to go out there and you know do these things to fix the world. Then I'll feel fine. Whereas I don't yeah. think that's really how it works. No, I mean, if I feel unsafe, if I feel unwell in my body, the place to go is to myself. Now, there may be a societal context to that. I mean, Gabor is absolutely right that there's, you know, certain conditions. I think poverty is one of the biggest ones yeah. that people just don't talk about. And it's a big problem. People don't talk about poverty in the UK, I think. But the, the, the idea that you can't fix yourself through trying to fix the world, you're in the wrong location. But in a way, it's appealing because turning in on yourself, really looking at your issues, addressing things, that's difficult. That takes real courage. So it's much easier to go out there in the world. And if there's a societal system that says that makes you a good person, and I think one of the big problems in our society is that we don't have a way to be good. Like if you were in feudal Japan or ancient Greece or even modern China, there's a clear way to establish virtue. And we need that. And it's almost a very old-fashioned idea to talk about ethics and virtue and morality. But we need that as people. We need a way to be good. And in the absence of that, people will adopt whatever they're offered, which may be a good consumer or a good social justice person. It's like, all you have to do to be good is this: is say this thing on social media. Mm. All right, so it offers people a cheap and easy way to be good. And potentially they feel that there's some, going to be some sort of healing in that. Um, which I mean, there could be, there could be. There is a point in post-traumatic growth where people help others and that's part of their own, their own healing. Um, but I've, yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of trauma in the kind of activism world and I think it would be a lot kinder uh, if that trauma was healed. Hey KK, do you believe in spring cleaning? Yes, but only when my wife does it. In Russia, men who clean are executed for not being real men, which is correct. Well, for those men who are living in the 21st century, Manscaped has an incredible offer for you. Manscaped are the global leaders in men's below-the-waist grooming and have forever changed the grooming game with their amazing performance package 4.0. Inside this care bundle, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0, trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, <laughs> performance boxer brief, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. This elite trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. Although your wearables might look like a couple of Boris Johnsons, treat them with respect and benefit from their proprietary skin safe technology. Complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. This stuff is legit and will have you smelling like royalty. The good kind, not Prince Andrew. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. It's time to throw out all your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. But there's also the glamorization of trauma and the glamorization of victimhood. So we come from yeah. the comedy industry. Yeah. Uh, and you just see people go, you know, they talk about their depression 
and it becomes a badge, an identity yeah. of I'm yeah. depressed. And, and you think to yourself, well, this may be true. And as somebody who has seen people in their family suffer from a real severe crippling depression, you go, well, that might be true, but how is it helping you what you were doing? And if you make an idea, if you identify yes. as depressed, are you going to want to get better? Right, because that's now who you are, right? So if someone's, I've had people introduce themselves at workshops by talking about their trauma. And I'm like, well, unless that's the point of what we're doing, that's strange to me. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, trauma's kind of like having a cop, you know, half of us have got one, but don't introduce yourself at parties by getting it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, it's, it's a little, it's a bit much. And if people are stuck, it, there's, a, there's a time when you need to say, I was abused or my people were abused, right? You're Ukrainian or Jewish or whatever it is, right? There's a time when that's helpful rather than saying it was nothing. I remember the first time I went to a therapist 20 odd years ago or whatever, and I was saying, yeah, I had an alcoholic dad and my cousin killed himself, and this, but it's nothing. It's not a big deal, right? And he was like, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So um, there is a time when it's helpful to adopt a trauma identity sort of as a passing thing. But I think getting stuck there, and if there's a culture in society that gives you kudos for being a victim, actually that doesn't help healing. Yeah. What helps healing is empowerment. You, you get over trauma by being empowered, right? This is why soldiers don't get traumatized when they're fighting. Soldiers get traumatized when they're being shelled, right? Like in World War I or on the Eastern Front now in Ukraine. Why? Because they're not empowered. When they're fighting, they have a sense of power. They have a sense of agency. So, you know, victim is the opposite of agency. It's the opposite of healing. The other thing that's critical and relevant to you guys is, to me, the opposite of trauma is actually play. So having a sense of humor, like my, my mentor is this wily old Jewish guy and he's always making all these jokes and some of them are just like, poof, they're pretty on the edge. Mm -hmm. And the jokes he makes with his patients, they're coming from a good place and they're very healing. It's very much part of Jewish culture and my, my experience of Jewish mentors. It that. is, yeah. yeah. What's interesting, I don't think that's true of all Jews, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, nothing's true of all Jews, but... What I, Not according to the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I remember I did a, a show at a, the Jewish Centre in London. Yeah. And they really didn't like my show, actually. Okay. Um, which is fine, people are allowed not to like my comedy. But, uh, well, they shouldn't be, but they are. <laughs> um, but what happened was afterwards there was like a Q and A, and somebody said like, "Why, why is your, why is your, like, why is your humor so dark?" Wow. And I was like, "Well, where I'm from yeah. in the former Soviet yeah, 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 Union, yeah. like," and I told this joke about how after a pogrom, after Jews have been yeah, massacred yeah, yeah. in a town somewhere in Russia, uh, the Jews sort of come back and they find the rabbi uh, who's been crucified on the wall of the synagogue, and they walk up to him and they go. Rabbi, Rabbi, does it hurt? And he goes, well, only when I laugh. And, <laughs> and, and I said that, and they had the same reaction as France. It's like, <gasps> am I allowed to laugh at that? But I've always thought that is the way the Jewish people in those parts of the world where they experienced yeah. awful mm -hmm. trauma learn to process it. And a lot of the Jewish jokes that I grew up with in, in Russia, in Uzbekistan, yeah. in Ukraine, they were based very much on that sort of like, we've had a horrible history and we're still laughing. Yeah, I mean, it might be more of a British thing and the British kind of Jewish community. I mean... The I've, Brits ruin I've, Jews. I've, <laughs> I've worked a lot with psychologists in Israel and a lot of them have got pretty wicked senses of humour. Yeah, That's yeah. my experience. That and makes people sense to me. can laugh at things. So it's, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's one of the... I think it's something that actually Britain adds quite well into the psychology world because um, Americans aren't very funny, okay? And they run psychology. There are stand-ups, of course, who are amazing. But as a culture, humor is not valued in the same way as it is in um, my family are Irish, so I'd say Anglo-Irish culture. Mm -hmm. Banter and humor is just everywhere. Mm -hmm. Australia, South Africa, the whole kind of British kind of area plus Ireland. And I think that's humor can be remarkably healing. It allows us to take space from something. Mm -hmm. It's also empowering because if you can laugh at something, it hasn't got you anymore, right? Like working in Ukraine last year, like with a lot of jokes. And as long as people understand you're laughing, you're not laughing at them. It's not, it's not, I talk about towards connection humor rather than away connection humor. And you can feel if someone's making a joke because they're just uncomfortable and they don't want to connect and they want to go connect themselves or others. Um, but I think it's remarkably underused by psychologists as a healing strategy.
and I said, my, I was lucky my mentor happened to be um, have a, a sick, sick fucking sense of humor. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, the other thing, I, before we move on to your experience of working in war zones and, and all that uh, light stuff, um, talking about, I mean, one of the things, as you know, we talk about a lot is the impact of social media on the world and the culture war and the mm -hmm. anger that, that seems to exist and everyone's constantly bickering and fighting. And we've, you know, we've had our fair share of it ourselves and, and been involved in it too. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do you see the impact of social media and the internet on the work that you do? I'll broaden that question out if you don't mind yeah. a bit. Mm. We are in a disembodied world. Mm. So what I mean by that is we're, we are regulated by self-regulation co-regulation, mm -hmm. we could say eco-regulation, like we're in a beautiful countryside here, you know, as soon as I got out of the car, today, I was like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. You relax, you know, as soon as I had dinner with you, like lunch with you guys, we chat, we eat together, move together, laugh together, you co-regulate. Mm -hmm. Self-regulation, I meditated this morning, right? It's actually the least important, I'd say, of those three. And theo-regulation, a term one of my Greek colleagues made up, uh, meaning like regulated by meaning. And Western civilization has lost a lot of its sense of meaning in the sacred. Yes. We've lost connection to nature, particularly in the big cities. I find, I mean, London on the weekend is super stressful compared to where I live in the, in the countryside. Uh, we've lost a lot of co-regulation. I mean, particularly, you know, during the Chinese plague, that was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call it that. Uh, during the Chinese plague, it was really... Uh, co-regulation was almost under attack. And you could be more or less conspiratorial about that, but... No faith. This this is what says I'm okay. You're okay, right? We don't like having babies. Hate it if you cover your face, right? Totally. Right? Or you play a game by covering your face and then smiling because they go get scared and they go, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Um. So this was covered. We weren't allowed to touch. We weren't allowed to be around each other. Like that's what keeps human beings sane. Mm. Like that is literally the the basis of our sanity. It is amazing how undermade that point was during the pandemic because it was like. Well, you, you've got to wear the mask because uh, it's for everyone's benefit. Well, I mean, very questionable, by the, but we won't go there. Um, but also, like, that side of it was never discussed. Almost no, almost no one went, actually, this is really bad for human beings. Co-regulation is the essence of physical health, let alone mental health, but even just physical health. Like, old people die without touch, without love, without connection. Babies die without this. They either die or if you feed them, they're like the remaining orphans. They grow up, you know, unwell psychologically, you know, even if you feed them physically. Remember the remaining authors? Yes, were, I do, yeah. So they were physically looked after, but they didn't have any touch. Actually, there's one beautiful slash tragic story from remaining orphans. There was one kid by the light switch, and there was hundreds of kids in this room. And every day the janitor would come in and turn the lights on and off, on in the morning, off in the evening. And as he was doing that, he would just ruffle the hair of this kid. Right? And that was the only kid that developed in that room full of hundreds of kids. Wow. Like just from one touch a day, that's how important it can be. Uh, it's beautiful and sad at the same time. And yeah, we, we're already, already in a culture which is lacking, not, that's not even a strong enough word, which is in poverty mm. of human touch and connection and community. We're in poverty when it comes to community in this yeah. culture compared to our actual ancestors who grew up in, and I won't idealize them, but they, one thing most tribal communities did have is co-regulation. And, um, and then with that ritual, you know, with that, like one of my students was saying the other day, why do I feel like an imposter? And I'm like, because the whole village hasn't initiated you into this career. You know, you haven't had the seal of approval of your elders. You haven't, mm. you know, you, you're not part of a community that has ritual and meaning and a shared religion and all the rest of it. Um, so that's, a, not having that sense is crazy. Being online sends us crazy. Mm. It's like being sat still sends us crazy. Like when we sit, we gradually lose our feeling sense. You do that all day long, staring at a computer. And social media is a conspiracy. I mean, it is. <laughs> it, it is. It's, it's literally designed to keep us anxious. So we spend more on the advertising. It's not, you know, someone's evil. They just want to make more money, mm. right? So it is a conspiracy in that it's designed to put us into fight or flight. So it's designed to put us into a trauma state, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, because if we're in that agitated fight flight state, we keep scrolling, we keep looking, we feel like, you know, did you ever have that experience where you like have a really nice weekend with your wife or your friends and you're in nature and you're lots of touch and everything's great? You don't feel like checking your phone. No. Because you're not anxious. 
it's also been it's, someone told me i think it's a work of bf skinner that the social media has been designed with the same principles as the gambling industry yeah or print conditioning so it's, yeah. it's reward and punishment right it's, it's there to give you little little dopamine hits right yeah and it's and once you start chasing that dopamine it's drug like so you're Oh, you yeah. get that hit and then you want ever yeah, increasing yeah, yeah. amounts of dopamine and what used to get you high now no longer does. So you're wanting the bigger and bigger rush. Well, I'm in long-term recovery. I'm 17 years sober, right? Mm. And, you know, it's very much like drug addiction as someone who's been in alcohol and drug addiction and needing that hit. I remember what it's like to wake up and look at Facebook straight away. Mm. You know, I have to put some boundaries around myself around that. You know, it's actually quite nice I don't get signal here. <laughs> so for yeah. the last two hours, I haven't checked my phone. It's kind of a relief. And I'm not against technology. I, you know, have a YouTube channel, a podcast. I think it's amazing that you guys can reach who you reach, you know, without being a big studio subject to corporate interests and things. So it's fantastic technology and use with care. Use we can. That goes for computer games, porn, just sitting emailing all day, uh, but particularly something like porn or computer games or social media that's been designed with that conditioning in mind. Um, so we're disembodied, and social media is a part of that. People lose their empathy when they're disembodied and basically become temporarily psychopathic. You know what? That is such a good way of putting it because I actually use my social media a lot less the bigger it gets yeah well you think you think it'd be the opposite i'd be like oh i'm on this number now oh let's keep feeding the machine and increasingly i'm just like well i, I don't like this the way we're having these discussions and uh it seems to me that you know we recently it's like th there's a sense that it it doesn't matter how angry how rude how destructive your approach is, it can never be angry, destructive, or rude enough for a lot of people. And this temporary yeah. psychopathy, yeah. Like, I mean, that's a very good way of describing it. I mean, that is the symptom of our culture generally. Some cultures, like I'd say Russian culture even more, you know, it's more endemic in some places and, you know, it's technologically enhanced here, it's trauma somewhere else. And essentially when you're not tuned into your body, when you're not got that natural empathic resonance, like, mm -hmm. If I would imagine a kitten, right? A fluffy kitten. If I were to take that kitten and strangle it to death, any normal person would have a physical response. They go, oh, gross, right? So, but if we're not in our bodies, if we're cut off from ourselves, whether it's through be trauma or being on the internet all day or whatever it is, that natural resonance isn't there. And that is very dangerous. And you see behavior on the internet, you go, would you talk to someone in a pub like this? Mm -hmm. Like one of my rules is don't accept behavior that would get you a punch in the head in the pub right? Like, like people don't do that normally. And actually in life, most people are all right. Most people are pretty centrist. They're pretty reasonable. You know, you go on the internet for five minutes, it looks like there's this huge, massive culture war. And I think that while that has come into real life to some degree, I got, um, I got banned from a cafe recently because they overheard me speaking and didn't like something I was saying and <laughs> uh, banned me from the cafe. I'm like, look, it's not Facebook, mate. Do you know what I mean? You're not unfriending me here. Like, we can have a conversation. What was the problem? I don't think I was saying anything too outrageous, but they didn't like my politics or whatever. And um, I just remember thinking, God, this is creeping a bit into real life. Well, that's why we are concerned about it, yeah. on the one hand. On the other hand, like, we had a guest on our show, uh, Sam Harris. And Sam said some things that I really fundamentally disagree with, but that's the point of the show. You could say something I fundamentally disagree with. And people went after him in a way that made us extremely uncomfortable. Strange, isn't it? Yeah. And I was like, okay, he said something that I fundamentally, I think is wrong. I also thought it was dangerous, that way of thinking. I didn't like it, I didn't agree with him. But people will go after him like he is the devil, yet when someone on their side attacks <laughs> someone else with far more viciousness and unpleasantness and whatever, th they are more than happy to see that happen. Yeah, and if, if we're not, well regulated and that comes from the self-regulation the co-regulation the eco-regulation if we're not well regulated it becomes intolerable and everything's a life threat trauma sees everything as a life threat mm. you know like everything's life and death and actually things aren't life and death we can disagree on things you know so who's more attractive south american mums or east european mums <laughs> you know we could have that we could have that debate but um 
you know, we can disagree. We can make silly jokes and humor can come back in if we're well regulated. I, you, forgiveness can come back in. And being like, hey, I didn't like what you said, but, you know, we can still get on. And I, I think we look at people being badly, badly regulated and we go, is that, that's their fault. Do more yoga. Go do yoga. <laughs> and it's like, but society is making everyone crazy. Yeah. You know, and we've lost our meaning in society and we've lost our cultural coherence and we've lost our connection to nature. So a little fucking yoga class twice a week isn't really going to cut it. Mm. You know, and I, go do the yoga. I love yoga. Yoga's great. We do martial arts we've been talking about. I think martial arts are fantastic. But honestly, you need community. You need friends. You need good relationships. You need nature. You need all these things that we evolved to, to have and to keep us sane. And um, in the absence of that, people get pretty prickly, to say the least. And we've been fed a lie in that, you know, it's social media. It's a way to build communities. It's a way to find friends. It's a way to make friends. And look, some people do make friends online. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not denigrating that. Yeah. But the reality is it's a very, very poor and pale imitation of what you can find IRL, as the kids say. Yeah, I mean, porn isn't sex, right? And, you know, Facebook friends aren't real friends. And these, you know, I think you can curate networks to make them friendlier. Like we have a Facebook group that's pretty, for our company, it's pretty friendly. And people are pretty cool there because we just don't tolerate anything else. Mm. And then, you know, we tolerate different views, mm. but not personally insulting people. Yeah, it's behavior uh, you prevent. Exactly. Yeah. We say you can say anything you want here, but you can't say it in any way. You can't personally insult people. Um, certain platforms may be friendlier. But personally, I, I look at it like going to a dangerous country. You know, I go to Instagram half an hour a week, do my Q&A, you know, interact mm -hmm. a little bit with some positive people, and then I turn it off my phone. Sometimes I'll even delete the app. Really? And yeah, I delete the app because you have to, I'd have to be then on Wi-Fi again to upload it again. And I just, I treat it like a job. It's like going to Afghanistan and coming out again kind of thing, you know? And as I said, it can be positive, but um, it's not what we're wired for. It's not what makes us healthy and... Um, Without without embodied practice, there's there's real problems. So we're talking about Instagram being like Afghanistan, and you have worked in war zones. I mean, the obvious question is, what is that like? Because because for most people listening and watching this, they have no idea. Thankfully, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you didn't have, expect that, yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, if you have deep seated trauma, um, <laughs> I mean, the first time I worked in a corporation, I went, oh, this feels like a war zone. So like the nervous system of the average business in London is like a war zone. Like, I was like, oh, this is familiar. It was familiar from my household growing up. It was familiar from places I've worked. And when I went to a war zone, part of me just relaxed and went, oh, okay, now the danger's real. Now I can actually accommodate this. I can actually do things to prevent this. Um, so, I mean, I've worked post-conflict in places that are actually quite nice, like Cyprus. I don't want to overstate this. It's not like I'm sort of, you know, getting shot out on the front lines or something, right? I mean... Going to Lviv, for example, it was anxiety provoking. And I remember, you know, the first, we're doing a-, a Lviv, just for people who don't know, is Western Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, so we're doing a trauma training there. It was like week two of the war mm. as well. So the war broke out. I wanted to go fight. That was my first response. I thought this is a violation, this is not okay. And I spoke to a few friends of mine, my friend Alex being one, if you're out there, Alex, good move. And he was like, Mark, um, you'll probably get shot if you're a soldier, but you're a pretty good trauma trainer. So I said, okay, we'll go do that. So I went to do a training out there. To, uh, the local psychologists were like, great, we need help, we're overwhelmed. You know, you can do a lot with just training people. And then, you know, the first alarm goes off on the first day. It's, and it's someone trying to kill you. You know, it's a rocket. There's a, there's a rocket coming in your direction. And it might be a way off. It might be close. You don't know. And there's that moment of like, shit, this is someone trying to kill me. And I've had that many times. You know, I've had that in Israel. I've had that in West Africa, East Africa. Slums of Brazil was probably the place that left the most mark on me. Um, but, I, you know, even though I've been to a lot of places, you could see everyone immediately does that. And I just go, right, guys, take a breath, take a moment. Let's walk to the bomb shell. We've got three minutes. Because mm -hmm. often people get hurt panicking. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty uncomfortable. Like half the training was done in a cold car park bomb shelter. You know, that was pretty uncomfortable. But then it's also, I don't want to play the violin too much because, you know, just around fantastic, awesome, wise, beautiful, cool people doing something meaningful. I mean, so many people lack meaning in their lives, you know, doing that project. I never felt like I was, my mate Polish Pete's driving, we're delivering medical supplies that we've picked up in a pretty dodgy way, but we're helping out because the 
hospital was cut off from, um, it was getting its supplies from Kiev. And at that point in the war, Kiev was surrounded, more or less. So they couldn't get supplies. So we picked some up and um, yeah, we were driving them there and it's kind of enjoyable. It's like, okay, this is a bit dangerous. And it's, um, you know, we've done risk assessments and things. So I mean, honestly, the chances were getting killed were probably 1% or something like less than that, you know. Again, no one overstate it compared to somebody who's volunteering on the front lines. Um, but there was meaning and there was community and I was working with great people and they're, they're messaging me today on the anniversary and there's, this, there's love and there's meaning and there's all those things. I mean, life purpose is huge, right? And I, I, just, I just went, I was made for this. You know, my mum said, don't go because that's what mums have to do, right? And I was like, mum, come on. I wasn't, uh, what was I made for if not this kind of thing? You know, this is a perfect job for me especially because I knew a bit of the language, I had a lot of connections there, you know. So, um, as I said, we, we, we did a training and um, eventually actually the local, some local um, psychologists, uh, a bunch of young psychologists, tell you, want to see people grow up quick. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference between a 25-year-old and teaching trauma work in Ukraine and a 25-year-old in East London, I'll tell you. But, yeah, the um, one in East London's probably seen more, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the team were basically just a bunch of young psychology. I went, because I thought I can't do this on my own. So I turned up at the local university and just went, give me a psychology graduate. Who have yeah. you got? And then I went to a, a convent, found a bunch of nuns who could help. And they were just psychologically trained. And eventually they um, set up a local charity. So they've, they've been doing it themselves. And they're um, very proud of them today, actually. They've trained, I think it's 13,000 people. Wow. Including all the nurses, doctors, and teachers in Lviv. Uh, which is one of the biggest cities in Ukraine, and it's full of refugees. Um, so it's probably the most trauma-aware city in the world now. Um, and they hope to expand it to the whole country, and they've already got people in Odessa and Kiev and places. Um, so and what are, you, what are you teaching them? Basic psychological first aid. So when people have acute trauma, so let's say you're in a car accident, mm -hmm. you're going to have, you're going to maybe shaky, you're going to have that response. There's things you can do that mean that's less likely to become a long-term trauma response. Like what? What can you do? Love people, empathize with them, appropriate touch. Uh, there are techniques you can use. I won't get too into here, but there's various kind of psychological techniques. Um, sometimes it's just uh, that co-regulation of another human being, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, what would you do if your child fell over and hurt themselves? Pick them up, give them a hug. Right, totally natural instinct, right? You touch, I mean, obviously you've got to be careful with touch. It's not always the appropriate thing to do. Um, bit of love, bit of attention, listening to people sometimes and being around them, giving them some advice, signposting them to useful resources. So instead of going to get drunk, they go to a psychologist or whatever, yeah? So psychological first aid. Uh, the other one is just psychological education. So trauma is different from a sort of physical illness and actually knowing about it really helps. Mm -hmm. Like knowing that that's a hyperarousal symptom. Ah, that's why I'm having problems with my partner. Mm -hmm. Um, so they do a lot of psycho psychoeducation as well, and they and they work with the you know the psychologists who are actually doing therapy, which is a whole different thing. And you know I couldn't train people as therapists in ten days. I'm not a therapist myself. Um, so um, yeah, it's brilliant what they're doing, and um, super proud of all the girls. They're nearly all girls, they're nearly all young women because the men are off fighting. I'm really proud of them, and um, you know as, as I said, emotional morning this morning to uh, for all, all of us. Yeah. Mark, do you, did you get a little insight into why certain people find war zones addictive? Yeah. I mean, I used to. And I, the, Ukraine was the first one I'd been to for quite a while because when I got married, I, I met my wife who's um, as an interpreter in the first part of the U Ukraine conflict. Because the conflict now is a continuity of a longer conflict. That's where I met her. And I sort of said, like, I won't do this anymore. And I'd, I'd, I'd given it up because I thought when you're married, it's a bit different, you know. Mm. And... Um, there's an attraction, you feel very alive. Mm -hmm. So the average office worker in the UK doesn't, isn't on their edge. They don't feel alive. And it was a year ago I was there and I can feel that like it was yesterday. And sometimes in a positive way, um, but it can take a little bit of getting used to being back home again. Um, Post-deployment or after the event is quite, quite difficult for soldiers. And I've worked with a lot of humanitarians I've mostly worked with, like Oxfam and Save the Children and stuff like that. And that's pretty difficult coming home because your mates are talking about the mortgage and the football and you're thinking about dead kids. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty rough. Like the coming home can be shocking. And then the aliveness of being there is in different places is, um, is certainly addictive. And I think these days I've sort of got a bit past that. Our next training is going to be done in Poland. I said, you know, 
let's do the, you can come to Poland and we'll do the training there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. It's interesting that thing that you talk about the aliveness because we, we had uh, Dan Hardy, former oh, UFC yeah. title uh, contender on the show. And he was talking about how before his big fights, he'd like, get his affairs in order. He'd like give books back to people and movies so that he could, you know, like he would go in there a hundred percent. And I, I think that that's a, I think so, you're right that so many of us lack that sense of aliveness uh, in our comfortable lives. And maybe that's the trade-off. Yeah, I mean, I found it in martial arts in the Western world and that was a very healthy way. My wife and I were going to the climbing wall recently, which again, super healthy, thing to, you know, have some excitement and adrenaline but in a controlled kind of um, very wholesome, actually, very wholesome climbing wall, just really good, nice people. Um, so these days I don't feel so drawn to it. You know, it was very light and there's only so much I can take. I mean, I'm not the toughest person and the story I'm supervising essentially. So there's about hundred trainers in Ukraine, right? And um, there's a management team and they speak good English. So I supervise um, online basically. And I help out and I give advice and I listen to them. And yeah, sometimes we talk about their boyfriends and Sometimes we talk about torture chambers and rape and, you know, shit like that. And there's only so much I can take with that. And I, I know my capacity now. Like, I know that I can do that a certain number of hours a week. And then I need to, you know, go talk to one of my business clients about their leadership thing that's much lighter. And um, I think knowing your capacity, and this is a big thing for anyone who's in the NGO world or in the humanitarian world the or nurse or anyone like that, you, you've got to be self-aware enough to go, okay, what's my limit here? And you see like teachers will burn out from working yeah. in the city schools and stuff as well, right? Yeah, you do. You, I think as a teacher in an inner city school, the average person has got about 10 years. Right. I think after that, you just get exposed and you see too much stuff where, and particularly when it involves children, I, it just makes far more of an impact. Obviously, when it happens to an adult, that is terrible and awful. It's rough for kids, though. So. Yeah, but with a kid, and when you see that what happens to them and what they go through, yeah. it, it really does leave an impact. Yeah, I got sent something. Curse on, if people want to have nightmares, curse on children's torture. They could Google. And people should know what the Russian military are doing in Ukraine. They should know, because some of it won't be on the BBC because it's too dark. And, um, you know, that got me way more than stuff I'd, I'd heard about adults, yeah. you know. And what should people know? <sighs> the extent of what's going on. What I mean, I, on? in terms of, I mean, this is, I actually thought about this ahead of time, going, this is trigonometry. Maybe this is the only actual trigger warning you should have. I mean, a real trigger warning is where you say, hey, this could, someone who's watching, who has gone through certain things, this could actually put them back in that. And like that's been extended to me and I'm just a bit upset about your politics or I don't like your glasses or something, right? Right, so, but actual trigger, like, I mean, there are things that I go, how much do we want to talk about that in a public space? Not knowing who's watching. I mean, the en endemic sexual violence of the Russian military, absolutely endemic, is heartbreaking. And I, I get fucking so angry when I think about it. And obviously, you know, the team there are hearing different stories from refugees and first-hand accounts. This is not made up. And the problem is the media have lost everyone's trust, particularly after COVID. And Trump, Brexit, yeah, then COVID. Yeah, we've been lied yeah. to so much that people think Ukraine's a lie. And actually, while the media presentation may be one-sided, there's a reason it's one-sided. It, one country invaded another one. And, you know, some of my friends who are a bit more alternative and conspiratorial will say, is, this, is there really atrocities in Ukraine? Yes, there is. And I'll, I just say people can look them up and Google them. Yeah, well, it's like weird. That. I sometimes get people on Twitter going, if this is a real war, why there's no footage? And I'm like, I can show you 50 Telegram channels. Yeah, <laughs> loads of footage. Yeah. Um, so endemic sexual violence. Yeah, I'd rather not go. No, no, I, I'm not. No, it. no one wants to go into the graphic detail. I'm just saying... I think people should hear the, the sort of slightly more generalized version of the things that people are dealing with. Just yeah, so I mean, that... so look at the history of, of what was the Soviet military. So people don't know this, but Berlin yes. was raped en masse. Not just Berlin, people, women in Poland. You Acro had nothing to do with Across the Eastern occupation. Europe, absolutely. Yeah. Across Eastern Europe. Millions uh, of rapes. But yeah, yeah. And but in Berlin, they think Berlin alone may have been one million. Yeah. Um, just an absolute nightmare. And the, no one was ever prosecuted. You can see YouTube footage of, you know, guys that were on TV in the 70s laughing about it. Old soldiers from the Soviet soldiers 
So, do you know Solzhenitsyn, he has a whole short story. He's talking, uh, he was very traumatized actually by by witnessing a gang rape by Soviet soldiers. Yeah, I mean, horrific stuff. And I knew it would happen. So when I, I spoke to my team, I said, you need to get ready to hear some stories. Because I, I just went, A, it does always happen in war to some extent, horrible as that is, but particularly with the historical precedent and particularly with a, a traumatized country that's already got a lot of numb people. So, like, if it happens in war anyway, but for example, there's very few instances of Israeli soldiers doing that in Israel. And there's reasons for that historically and how the militaries are and the accountability. Now, not to say they don't do other things that may be not okay, but that's just just not that. Mm -hmm. It's just not that. Mm. And, um, yeah, certainly the civilian targeting. It's not just the odd missile that's, you know... A friend of mine was in an area of Kiev that was just being shelled by artillery and it was absolutely totally civilian air and it was shelled for days, maybe weeks on end. Uh, my mother-in-law was in a town far away from the, the front line and was doing a shopping. And um, the shopping centre opposite was blown up and, you know, an old lady jumped on her and stopped her getting killed and she ended up having dust covered in her and, you know, there's a, a picture of a pram with a child's foot next to the pram. And that was just out, that was literally... A, 20 meters from where my mother-in-law was, you know. So these are first-hand accounts we're talking about here, you know. And, um, yeah, maybe there was a military meeting at the back of the shopping center, someone had said, or something like this. But um, the civilian targeting is absolutely clear what's going on. It's a, it's a terrorizing and it's a genocide. It's not you're having a war and in war, you, you know, sometimes you break eggs to make omelets kind of thing. It's not that. It's not that at all. So the civilian targeting uh, would be another one. You know, what goes on every t- every time they push back the Russians. And Butcher was the first time. Yeah. I mean, my team before and after Butcher was two different. It was kids and then it was adults in that team after Butcher. And that's because it was the first time Russians would push back and then they discover things. And Butcher was tiny compared to things since. So what's going on behind the lines, kids being abducted and taken to Russia, I don't know. But every time that line is pushed back, And, you know, that seems to be, God willing, the Ukrainian military is doing a great job. I mean, you know, Putin is losing and the Russian military is is incompetent despite still being very dangerous. Um, It's not my expertise to talk about military matters. Um, However, you know, Putin increasingly to me looks like a weak old man. And as he is pushed back, we will see the extent of some of these atrocities because most of the land that was taken, a lot of the land that was taken is still there. And so, and so what do you do with a population like that, where awful, terrible things like the, like the events and the acts that you have spoken about, what, what do you do to- After the event? After the event to create some kind of heat? <sighs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what normally happens is it doesn't heal and then it just repeats. So you see yeah. that in the Middle East. Russia is a case study of that, right? Well, actually, I was going to ask you this, not to interrupt your train of thought, but you've alluded repeatedly that Eastern Europe is a part of the world that people uh, carry a lot of trauma. And and one of the things I remember, there's a Russian psychologist whose name I won't remember now, who talks about how Russia is one of the countries with the highest rates of domestic violence and And physical child abuse, Yes, uh, where it's kind of considered normal for adults to beat their children to get them Mm. to behave or whatever. And he basically talks about how that carries through. And actually, there was even more interesting. There was somebody who talked about how if you look at the sort of things that people search for in porn by country, (laughs) it shows a very sadistic uh, mentality in certain countries. And Russia's at at the top of that list. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I mean, I know, for example... Where does that come from? uh, Lack of empathy. And where does that come from? Trauma. And where does that come from? Uh, Russia's history. I mean, you, you know, Russia's been invaded by everyone from the Mongols to Napoleon to the Polish to uh, Hitler. Swedes, Lithuanians. Uh, and then on top of that, they've, yeah, Swedes, Lithuanians, so on top of being invaded by the Swedish. How embarrassing. <laughs> and on top of that, they've added their own level of trauma with the, the gulags, as you know, yeah. or, you know, in your book, you detail this. Um, the level of trauma in the Soviet system was just yeah. huge and endemic. And this is a wound that's a huge wound. This is never to excuse any immoral behavior, you know, and if we really want to understand it, we should understand that traumatized, you know, numb people hurt people. Yeah, because that natural, we're, unless we're actual psychopaths, which is a very small percentage of the population, the majority of us, like as we were talking about sexual violence there, you know, it feels gross. 
right? It's not a comfortable, pleasant subject. And that's a normal human response. And that can be cut off through the numbing of trauma. And particularly when it's endemic and it's over time and it's multiple periods, it becomes a norm. So you see little Russian kids, they're like, look, yeah, they're smiley, they're happy, they're active. They're... And in a few years, they're, you know, the affect is gone on the face, right? The, the Russian smile, and oh, you know, that mm. kind of classic Russian look. Yeah. Or in the chest, you'll see the classic tension bands. It's called armoring in body psychology. Mm. Um, you know, you can spot a Polish person in the street in England, can't you? Because there's a certain look, yeah. you know, in the body. Um, so it doesn't mean that everyone who has trauma becomes abusive or unpleasant. Some people go the opposite way. They become very sensitive and compassionate. Um, but there's a good number of people who that trauma shuts down that natural empathy. On top of that, you'll see like the drug, you know, Russian men die 10 years younger than Russian women because of the rates of alcoholism. This, this is- I, Average I, life expectancy for a man in Russia is 64. Yeah, it's not great. So yeah, the, the self-medication side of things is there. You know, they made it recently not illegal to beat your wife unless you hospitalize her. That's a law in Russia. Yeah. You can hit your wife unless if you be hospitalized, that's maybe illegal, but you probably won't get prosecuted. You know, I've worked a lot with the gay community in Russia. You, you see it in the way people other other groups and make them them and us kind of thing. So it's in the thinking. That scarcity of this not enough. And you will see that worse all across Eastern Europe, but you'll see it worse in Russia. And it kind of gets softer as you... There was a story that, that became viral of a woman who... Um, the Ukrainians were hacking a lot of communications because a lot of the Russian soldiers were using mobile phones and they found messages from this woman on a, I think it was a dead soldier's phone actually, um, from his wife saying, oh, I know you're going to have sex with the local women, but just use a condom. Yeah, I've seen that footage too. Yeah. My wife showed me that. Yeah, and she you're kind of translated it. You're it a woman. Russian. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck are you talking so about? It becomes a coldness to others. Yeah. Mm. And the Russian um, reputation for coldness is not undeserved. That's not, you know, I've got, <laughs> it's like the racism. I've got lots of good Russian friends. Yeah? <laughs> but I do have a lot of Russian friends. They used to be colleagues. And people can be very loving and caring once you're on the inside of that. Mm. And the same with my Jewish friends. But again, that's another trauma thing. It's them and us. It's your inside or your out. Every time I go to Israel, I put on five kilos because I get fed so much. In that sort of, you know, you've got to eat food or else we're going to starve to death. It's a trauma pattern. You'll see it in Poland too. Mm. So you used to see it more in Ireland, though it's kind of fading now because the famine was way back. Um, so these cultural trauma patterns exist and they, they run through us even if we ourselves haven't had personal traumatic experiences. And I think it is important that we talk about trauma at this level and not let it just become a middle-class pursuit. I actually emailed a lot of the top world's top trauma people. We run summits and conferences. I know a lot of these guys. And I messaged them before Ukraine saying, hey, any advice? And a lot of them messaged back saying, oh, I don't really know what to say because we don't really deal with real trauma. <laughs> and I was like, you've made millions from this. It's big business trauma now. Now there is exceptions to that. Stephen Porges is great, who does polyvagal theory, which I recommend people look up. Uh, David Baselli has a technique called TRE, which is a shaking trauma release technique. He was great. He's ex-humanitarian. So there are exceptions. But there's a trauma, whole trauma industry now and this kind of weird middle-class far left politics around it where it just becomes a way to sort of beat people around the head and claim status. And it also makes people feel different. Being like being special. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be part of the herd. No one wants to be part of the tribe anymore. Everybody wants to be, you know, separate, have their own unique thing. And in a way, these people are feeding that demand. It's capitalism in action, really, isn't it? <laughs> there's a market for it. Yeah, there's a market for it. There's a market for it. As soon as we make the victim sacred, then it, it, it puts it up on a pedestal. And Jonathan Hyatt's talked about that better than I can. I think what we've lost is the value of strength. So the Ukrainians I know are strong, male and female. Some mm -hmm. strong women I work with, some badass, I married one, some badass women. You know, and the men, and they, they say things like, we love our men, they defend us from attack. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so nice to hear something nice about men, <laughs> you know? And there's a way in which um, strength in Eastern Europe isn't uh, mocked. I, you know, I mean, I'm staying in East London tonight and I'm looking around kind of trendy hipster East London. And I, I just see weak boys dressed like clowns. <laughs> like, come on guys, you know, like, it's not a virtue to be weak. 
I think is it someone gives the example of, I, I read my dad's eulogy at his funeral. He wasn't a perfect man, but there was love there and I wanted to read his eulogy. And I was glad I had that martial arts training when I wasn't a mess. I was able to help with the parking and greet my uncle. And, you know, I was glad when I read his eulogy that I could do that. I was glad I had the strength, even though I was scared to go to Ukraine. It's not about not being scared, right? Um, we need that. And we need it for life. Like life, I don't know if people notice, but life is fucking hard. Like life is cancer. Life is you, your mum having Alzheimer's right? Life is, life, if your life isn't hard now, great. Let's be grateful. Mm. Let's be grateful for the, we were saying this at lunch, right? We live in this wonderful place. Like I have a comparison point. I'm staying and living in this nice little English town in the West of England. And every day it's like, this is amazing. This is so much fucking better than Afghanistan. Mm. Mm. There's a, you know, immigrants aren't mugs. They're mm. not trying to move here because they're idiots. They're trying to move here because it's nice. Mm. Yeah. And this self-hating has got to stop. You know, to actually to embrace the, the Western civilization and the strengths we have, even if we're not perfect. And Ukrainians want to be Western. Mm -hmm. You know, they're leaning towards the West. That's what Putin doesn't want. But that's their choice. And they're not doing that because they're CIA manipulated or something. They're doing that because it's fucking better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why they're doing that. You write about this in your book. And it's, um, you know, for me, what's, what's missing is, is a practice for that. So I'm an embodiment teacher, right? So trauma is part of what I do. Mostly I'm training coaches, yoga know, teachers, business people, and they don't have a practice. So in Japan, kids do kendo, kids do martial arts, right? Some cultures, it's the kids get something to meditate or whatever, right? We don't have that in the West. We used to have it with sports. We used to have it with sports. So, you know, there's this saying, Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Because originally, you know, we invented all the good sports here, as you know, France. And originally, sports were thought of as character formation. And then they became entertainment or something else. They originally, they were embodied practices. And I see that re-emerging in you know, climbing and other things. It doesn't have to be Eastern, though it could be. And I, I feel like that's what we really lack here is something to, a praxis, it's called psychologically, to build the value, to embody the values that are there. And, um, you know, Ukrainians are fighting to be part of that world. Mm. And so many people in this country and other Western countries are just throwing it away like it was nothing. It's an observation that I, I had some time ago when I, I sort of looked around and I see that in a world where men are actively discouraged from being men, which is I, what I think is happening, uh, you see increasing numbers of young men going to the gym to get buff. Right, to look to the, the impersonation of manhood. And, and, and I, don't, I don't, I mean, some people will be insulted by that description. Yeah. And like most of the guys over there behind the scenes, they're all Good looking buff. boys. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it, there is, it, to me, it's a displacement effect where to me, what, strength, what well, you're talking about strength, that's not about being 6'2 and having big guns. It's, it's about a mental resilience. Yes. It's about a willingness to stand up for things you believe in. It's about a combination of traits that used to be, as you say, considered like necessary and important and are appreciated, by the way, by women in society, yeah. right? And, and it can be built in the gym because mm -hmm. you can go to the gym and face hardship and you can go to the gym. You can go to the gym to look nice, right? Yeah. To look like some magazine says you should look, right? But you can be in the gym going, okay, I'm here for my discipline. And this is, you know, to do something difficult, whether it's, the problem with Western life now is it's too easy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes us weak. Right, it's a very simple, yeah. simple problem we have. It's a nice problem to have. Um, so cold showers, I take cold showers. Yeah, I, you know, because it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, right. And you make yourself do it. The same with I lift weights, but same with meditating. You know, I sit quietly with myself. That's not easy. I mean, I did a lot of martial arts before I went on a meditation retreat, mm -hmm. and like five days of silence. I mean, you know, from an Irish background, that was fucking <laughs> a bit much. You know, so there's that. And then um, I talked to you the saying to Francis earlier that my students, we send them to yoga, martial arts, conscious dance, but we also send them to improv, and that's one of the things they're most scared of because that's a social humiliation potentially. You know, that takes real courage. I think it's why we respect the Joe Rogans and the, you know, the different comedians who are in this space because we know that verbal strength and the emotional strength to stand up and tell a joke and it may be full flat. You know, that's another kind of strength. So yeah, you can work out in the gym, but you can work out in the dojo, you can work out in the meditation cushion. There's lots of ways to be, you know, back to the beginning of the story, right? These were the strengths that I didn't have 
as a 17 year old who'd read every book in the library. You know, Wikipedia isn't solving all the world's problems. We don't need more information. You can get your phone out and have all the information you want, but how are we training ourselves? And we need to, because you know, if Ukraine isn't coming to the door now, and it might, but if, you, if a war isn't coming to the door, cancer is or divorce is, or your kid could get ill, God forbid, or do you know what I mean? It's like something's coming to Life the door. Life happens. Yeah. Life happens, yeah. man. So it's like, if being weak is actually irresponsible. Being, being weak makes you a liability to the tribe. What does it, it mean to be weak? To not be able to uh, handle adversity. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily, I think there's levels of it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a physical strength and maybe if you're eight years old, you don't have that. But when you're 80, you might have a lot of emotional strength. Yeah, the person that can read the eulogy, the person that can talk to their friend who's been sexually assaulted and actually be with her when you're hearing things you don't want to hear. Yeah, the person that can just get up in the morning and go to work because they've got to put food on the table, that kind of resilience. There's layers to it, right? So um, physical, I think, is part of that. To be relatively healthy, I think, is, is a helpful thing. It can be a good foundation. I think martial arts are a great training. You know, if I was running the school system, I, you know, would absolutely, like the Japanese, I would make that mandatory kind of scholastic kind of thing. But just having this mentality, it's the kind of weak point in the West that we, we have some great strengths in the West. And it's, again, I'll be the first to tell them, but we, we tend to be a bit cognitive, tend to wait, think we, we, we're not going to think our way out of this one. So... Um, yeah, for me, I was glad I had that training doing the Ukraine project, tried to pass some of that on. And I always say to, to, to the people there, do your practices, you know, do your yoga, do your meditation, do, the, do, do, do what you can. Because when, if you're self-regulated as well as you can be, when you're with other people, you can pass that on. Yeah, and it's about confronting adversity. That to me is, is strength. It's, it's being prepared to work on your weaknesses. Like we've used the analogy of the gym, and you know, young guys going to the gym. Yeah. To me, it's it's seeing a guy who's buff on top and he's got little <laughs> chicken legs, you know, parsnip body is what I call them. Yeah, the yes. Parsnip. So facing things that are difficult deliberately and systematically. Mm -hmm. You can't just, people say, oh, parenting's my practice. That's not a practice because life's just throwing stuff at you. I can't say to my partner, can you be 20% less annoying because I'm trying <laughs> to find the sweet spot here, you know? Yeah. Um, so the beautiful thing about a gym or a dojo or somewhere where there's kind of that kind of control is we can find that spot that's difficult but not traumatizing. Like a good Aikido dojo or a good karate dojo, they won't traumatize you, they will challenge you. Yeah, same, you know, weightlifting, you put a mount on the bar that challenges you. Um, and if we're not challenging ourselves, then yeah, we will be gradually getting weaker. And then when life throws something too much at us, we will break and we'll not only let ourselves down, we will let our loved ones down. And that's unacceptable. Yeah, and I don't think we talk about that enough. No. No, we, we pretend that strength is a, is a vice and weakness is a virtue, and it's not. Why do we do that? I don't know. I think potentially the, emasculate, the emas emasculation of Western cultures, there's potentially an agenda there. I think we've confused cognitive knowing with wisdom and with... Uh, skills acquisition. So it's a problem in understanding what learning is. Like the English verb to learn actually means a bunch of things. Um, I mean, a weak populace is easy to control, right? If we wanted to get, if we wanted to get our tinfoil hats out, right? We're, we're, we're easily manipulatable if we're, we're nice consumers, perhaps, if we're not in touch with our own values. I mean, an advert says buy X, right? Now, if I'm tuned into myself and I go, do I, do I need X? Can I live without X? Do I feel resonance for that? Do I want that? So I think it's potentially something to do with the wider system, but it's a bit above my pay grade. So I think I'll say I'm not sure about that one. Mark, and uh, on that happy note, yes, <laughs> uh, we uh, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Actually, just uh, it's interesting you mentioned about having a controlled environment because I always get really frustrated when I go and play basketball somewhere, uh -huh. and I'm not a good basketball player. But if the level is not good enough for me, I, I can't play there. Because you're not on your edge, right? Yeah, and I, the level, like ideally, everyone has to be better than me. Uh -huh. Like that's my sweet spot. A bit better though, right? Not uh, like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't want to play with Michael Jordan. I mean, I'd love to play with Michael Jordan, but I don't think it'd go well. Um, but anyway, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. 
Uh, and the last question we always ask is, what is the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Okay. What say you to so that? First of all, I'd say look up Sane Ukraine, the charity in Ukraine, financially not connected with me, independently run, if people want to support that. Um, thing we're not talking about. Mm. Gratitude. We mentioned it at lunch. I think, you see, I, I got a bit angry today, you know, some of the things we're talking about kind of, oh, I get my blood up, you know. And I'm really grateful to live in the UK. I'm really grateful we have peace. I'm super grateful to you guys. I want to say a personal thank you. You know, like watching this show made me feel less lonely when there was council culture things happening in my life a few years ago. You know, I'm personally grateful. And um, I think gratitude is the emotion of enough. And in, in a consumer culture where the tech apparatus is set up, set up to make us feel not enough and to want more and to be anxious, anything that brings out that feeling of, you know what, I'm really grateful. And um, that is a cure for a lot of ills. So um, thanks for reminding me of that today, guys. Perfect. Well, thank you for coming on. And if people want to find you online, where's the best way to do that? Or your courses or your work? Yes. Uh, the word embodiment, if you put that into Amazon, Instagram, uh, Tinder, like not Tinder, <laughs> uh, Grindr, um, embodimentunlimited.com. We've got an app, we've got a website, loads of free resources on trauma and other things there, embodimentunlimited.com. Mark Walsh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you guys for watching and listening. We'll see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it is always available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. What does he think about people claiming to have PTSD after someone has disagreed with them online? And how does their trauma compare with that of people who have been in war zones? <laughs>